Today, we are going down into the depths to talk about one of the biggest downward spirals in fighting game history. A game so unlucky, so undervalued, and so mistreated by casuals, competitive players, and even the people who made it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a look at the failure of Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle. The failure of BB Tag started all the way back in 2016, the year Capcom let the FGC down with the release of Street Fighter V. Now, I know, I know. What does Street Fighter V have anything to do with BB Tag? Two words, cultural impact. Ever since Street Fighter 2, the Street Fighter series has always been the biggest series in the genre and would set the tone for the community based on that genre. While obviously I'm exaggerating a little bit, it still rings true. Where Street Fighter went, so did the FGC. So you can imagine what would happen when the latest mainline Street Fighter game would turn out to be a broken, half-baked shell of a game. People were disappointed to say the least, and that disappointment turned to anger, and it was spread not to just Street Fighter V, but all fighting games. The community was hypercritical, and if you wanted to release a game during that time, good luck. Now there were exceptions. This era paved the way for Tekken 7 to show out, as well as Undernight Ember, an Arc System Works answer to Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Dragon Ball Fighters. But everyone else pretty much drowned. I tend to call this time frame when all the FGC was suffering the fallout of the downfall of Capcom, the Dark Era. And unfortunately, this was the stage that BB Tag was to launch in. BB Tag was a crossover game made by Arc System Works. Team Blue, the team in charge of the Blaze Blue series, and basically any other 2D fighting game that Arc System Works has made, led by none other than the creator of Blaze Blue, Toshimishi Mori, opposite of Team Red, who works on Guilty Gear and Arc System Works 3D Pipeline. They actually made an interesting video about it. I'll leave a link in the description. Now, I'm not sure if it was incompetence or some kind of disconnect between Arc System Works and Team Blue, but I'm just going to say it. I think BB Tag was meant to fail from the start, and looking at the timeline, I honestly can't see it any other way. Let's start with the year of its launch, 2018, two years into the Dark Era, which had just been extended thanks to Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. The game that people were looking for to signal the return of Capcom from the failure of Street Fighter V crashed and burned in 2017. Arc would capitalize on this with the release of Dragon Ball Fighters on January 26, 2018. DBFZ had everything. Interesting gameplay, well, kinda. Top of the line graphics that fit DBZ's anime style. And most importantly, it used one of the most popular IPs in the world. To say that DBFZ was popular would be an understatement. DBFZ would be one of the few games to call its way out of the dark era. BB Tag will release five months later, on May 31st that same year. This is plenty of time to have the release of one game not affect the other, and DBFZ wouldn't have had any effect on BB Tag's success. But Dragon Ball Super, the anime, had different plans. You see, the Future Trunks saga was reaching its climax around the time that BB Tag was supposed to release in America, and the DBFC crew had no choice but to capitalize on this. So on the same day as BB Tag's release, they added Fusamatsu and Fujito Blue as DLC. This means that BB Tag had to be nothing short of the best game ever to succeed. So what does Team Blue do to try to counteract this impending doom that was BB Tag's highly contested launch? They started releasing a bunch of trailers showing off the starting cast of the game in chunks. Fighting games tend to do this to the hype of the launch of the game. 
and it's a good model. But Team Blue made a mistake. As I said before, BB Tag is a crossover game featuring four series Blaze Blue, Persona 4 Arena, Undernight Inbirth, and a surprise fourth series being Monty Om's Ruby. Now, Ruby has four main characters Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang. Now, common sense would say, hey, let's add them all to the base game. But I don't really know what had happened in the Art System Works office that day, but they decided to split the team up and have half be part of the base game and the other half be paid DLC. To put it lightly, everyone disliked that, and BB Tag had a firestorm on his hands. Ruby fans were not happy, and the Dark Era had the FGC in an uproar over planning Day 1 DLC. They would quickly backpedal and make both Blake and Yang free DLC, but it was too little too late. The fire and pitchforks were already out, and then the game launched, and it was not perfect. I should know, because I bought the PC version of it day one, and I can tell you, it didn't work. And even if you managed to get the game running, good luck playing it online. The PS4 version fared a little bit better, but it had some of the same issues when it came to the online mode. Team Blue would later fix it with a patch within a week, but it was too little, too late. The fuel was already added to the fire, but honestly this damage was nothing compared to what had happened when people actually played the game. Expectations is what I would say would be the key to BB Tag's downfall. It didn't matter if BB Tag had a bad launch in the middle of the Dark Era. It didn't matter if BB Tag had to compete with highly anticipated DLC to a mega popular game. It didn't even matter if BB Tag had to be dragged through the mud because of stupid DLC practices. As long as the game was good, all of that will be water under the bridge. If you ask me, BB Tag is a good game. It just took a little bit to see what made it good. But that's the problem. It took work to see why it was good. Why? Because in order to get people to play the game, BB Tag played with people's expectations. The main three being that one, BB Tag was a team game, kind of like the old school versus games. Two, the Blaze Blue part of Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle meant it played like Blaze Blue. And three, you get to play your favorite characters from across all four different series. Sad to say, if you had any of these expectations, you would be disappointed, as BB Tag failed all three by design. So I would like to start off by saying that there is a difference between team fighting games and tag fighting games. I know it sounds like semantics, but there is a difference. Hear me out here. It basically boils down to how much the inactive character, the character you are not controlling, can do to help out the active character, the character you are controlling. In team games, the inactive character is normally limited to just assist and switching out. But in tag games, the inactive character normally has way more options and mechanics attached to them. Now, the reason I had to explain this is to help lead into BB Tag's dual nature. BB Tag the team game and BB Tag the tag game. It wouldn't be hard to guess what kind of game BB Tag is. I mean, it's in the name. But the problem is, until you reach a high enough level at the game, both versions of BB Tag are completely valid. Now, I honestly question if this was a deliberate move by Team Blue or a lack of pushing people to the tag mechanics. But low to mid level, you 100% can play BB Tag like a team game. And if you did, you will be disappointed because BB Tag is a shallow team game. Even compared to simple execution games like Power Rangers, Battle for the Grid, you would find way more depth in that game. The worst part is, I can argue that BB Tag, the team game, was an excellent building block for the real version of BB Tag. BB Tag, the team game, will teach you all the basics really quickly, as it is easy to pick up. Getting all the other stuff in the way before he has to handle the beast that was BB Tag's tag mechanics. Which, to be honest, is very weird to wrap your mind around at first, because there's nothing like it. That's why I think this dual nature was intentional, and this expectation was 100% warranted. Because how the game was built, you could easily miss out on the game's true nature, because you had to dig to find it, and no one wants to dig like that. Let's move on to the next two expectations, because they are linked. I'm just gonna say it, 
Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle was a bad name for this game. It sets up the idea in people's heads that BB Tag was going to be a Blaze Blue game, and it is nowhere near. Honestly, the engine feels more like Persona 4 Arena than Blaze Blue, and it's easy to see why they did it. They wanted the Blaze Blue fans to pick up this game. A marketing ploy. That's a pretty easy way to get people mad, don't you think? But hey, at least you get to play your favorite characters, right? Well, no. Which leads to the biggest failed expectation of BB Tag. In a crossover fighting game, the biggest draw of the game is that you get to play your favorite characters. The problem is, if that was your aim, it would be a roll of dice to see how disappointed you were when you started playing BB Tag. As everyone was changed to fit the game, BB Tag's controls were simple and had fewer options in the fighting games that the characters reported from. So everyone lost something. Simpler characters, not so much, but more complex characters had their tools cut down and streamlined. And that's not even taking into consideration how normals were changed to fit the combo system. It goes without saying that people have a history of not liking change when it comes to fighting games. But even though this is a spinoff and changes were to be expected, the disappointment was still there and people already up in arms against the game. So it didn't matter if it was a spinoff. The crazy thing is, this need to happen because oh boy, I don't think I wanted to play another game where characters like Batista and Nagato had their full tool set, or at least in a game where four characters can be doing stuff on the screen at one time. The core issue is that all three of these expectations were valid, as Team Blue used these expectations to sell the game. The problem is that it was the dark era that you see, so people had no patience with dealing with what has seemed like false advertising, and people did not want to stick around to see BB Tag's true nature. I do not blame people for this, but if it was just that, BB Tag would have a much more different story. BB Tag's core strategy was pulling four different communities together. Blaze Blue fans, Persona fans, Under Night fans, and Ruby fans. Each group had a different response to BB Tag, and surprisingly, not all of them were negative. Let's start with the one I think is the most important to BB Tag, the Ruby community. And I say the most important because they had never had a fighting game before. While with the other three, the appeal of BB Tag was always going to be an uphill battle because every character had a source game that no matter what, BB Tag was going to be compared to. Ruby, on the other hand, was a blank slate, and that lack of expectation was critical. All Team Blue had to do was make sure that BB Tag was fun and enjoyable for what would be most of these people's first fighting game. They almost failed at this before we were releasing the game when they announced that Blake and Yang was going to be paid DLC until the uproar made a free DLC. But BB Tag is an easy to understand game at lower levels. And it also helps that three of the main characters are really strong in the game. With Ruby and Yang staying in the top 15 no matter what, Team Blue knew what they were doing and Ruby fans ate the game up filling out much of the game's casual fan base, which makes sense. Ruby at the time was the biggest fan base. Blaze Blue's an anime fighting game, so its fan base is already small. Undernight was a younger game, so it was even smaller, which leaves Persona, which was bigger than the last two, but I can't say if it was bigger than Ruby or not, at least at the time. By the time BB Tag came out, Persona 5 had already released and was in the middle of a massive popularity spike. That should be an open and closed case, but I can't really call these people Persona fans, per se, as they were really just fans of Persona 5. It would take a little bit of time for them to spread out to the older games, which Persona 4 Arena and therefore BB Tag sourced their characters from. So BB Tag wouldn't have gained much from that. But speaking about Persona, Persona 4 Arena and Undernight fans had mixed reception to BB Tag. It was mostly met with either apathy or they liked the fact that their games was part of a crossover spin-off game, which would hopefully get people interested in the real game, or at least more so for Undernight. Because until recently, the only way to play Persona 4 Arena was to get on PS3 and Xbox 360. Now for the Blaze Blue community, it was a different story. As I covered earlier, there were expectations attached to BB Tag, and none were hurt more than the Blaze Blue fan. Let me set the scene. 
The year was 2016, but before the year had ended, the latest and greatest Blaze Blue game had came out, after a long line of three other games starting from 2008. But this game was different. Blaze Blue Central Fiction had a little too much push to it. Important non-playable characters started becoming playable. Spin-off characters from Blaze Blue mangas and visual novels started getting added. The story was being tied up. The final bosses were being shown, and spoiler warning, the main character, Ragna the Blood Edge, dies at the end. Central Fiction was looking like it was going to be the last mainline Blaze Blue game. People were scared. Blaze Blue sold vastly worse than its predecessor, Chrono Phantasma. No one wants their favorite series to end. So imagine, the next game with Blaze Blue in the title ended up being BB Tag, which shares nothing in common with Blaze Blue other than 10 bizarre version characters. And to add fuel to the fire, the execution was mega simple compared to the execution that Blaze Blue was known for. So people were wondering, was this the future of Blaze Blue? People were asking this question and it kind of got heated from there. So BB Tag became an easy target for the community to lash out their frustrations on. At least, until a bigger target came. But we are missing one more community to talk about, and that's the FGC as a whole. And I kind of already said how they felt about this. Back in the day, Persona 4 Arena was grilled for having command reversal button, having most of the specials be quarter circle forward motions, and auto combos, calling in a casual game even though it had more complex mechanics. Now we have BB Tag that has a command reversal, most of the specials being quarter circle forward, and two of the three dedicated attack buttons being auto combos. And you have to dig to get to this easy to miss, more complex mechanics. To summon the FGC, BB Tag looked like a game for straight up babies. A party game, not made for competitive play. BB Tag's reputation with the FGC wouldn't be great at the start. Even now, it still hasn't cleared up completely, even though people know more about the real version of the game. But let's move on and talk about something that both helped and hurt BB Tag. DLC. A bit of a cold take here, but I like DLC in fighting games. The Season Pass model is a much better alternative to buying a new version of the game over and over again, and I get to play the new stuff earlier. Now when it came to BB Tag, DLC was a very interesting topic, because BB Tag has so many characters from 4 different series to pull from, keeping constant hype around the game, with discussions about who was coming to the game as DLC, much like Super Smash Bros. So how can Team Blue mess this up for BB Tag? Well, I'm glad you asked. By announcing all its DLC before the game's release, and having most of your cast be DLC within 2 months of the game being out. Let me explain. BB Tag started off with 20 characters at the start. That's a pretty good size for a fighting game, and even better if you take into account that it's a 2v2 game. So the character pool feels even bigger. It's pretty normal at the start to announce some kind of season pass so they can start sprinkling in DLC. It's good for the game, and it makes the age of discovery longer in order to keep players playing the game. Now, Team Blue wanted this game to outdo all others, so they announced Season Pass 1 for BB Tag with 20 characters, two of them being Blake and Yang. So you can kind of figure out where this is going. With the exception of Blake and Yang, the rest of the characters will be in 6 sets of 3 characters. It will make sense that Team Blue would do this, because BB Tag is a reused asset crossover game, just like Marvel vs. Capcom 2, so they could easily pump out a lot of characters with little tweaks here and there. And most of the games were done in-house, or are currently partnered with Arc System Works. So they had no trouble getting the resources. Honestly, this would have worked if they just had spaced it out. And that's the weird part. Normally spacing things out would be cause for complaint, but this was the opposite problem. It's my guess that they packed what could have easily been 3 characters every 2 months, because of BB Tag's less than stellar lead up and launch. To try to derail its downward spiral down. but. In doing so, it made it worse. The even weirder part was that the DLC characters weren't even the problem. None of them were meta-destroying, and they added much more flavor to the game. The DLC was also well-priced. It was just too much at one time. But we had talked too much about what happened around the game. Let's talk about the game.
Hopefully it got the message across by now. BB Tag's launch was less than stellar. People thought it was a casual game, not meant for competition, and too much DLC made it look bad. So how could it get any worse? Let me introduce you to the concept I like to call a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is basically anything that gives the player the best chance of winning in the game. Think of your top tiers, your optimal teams, advanced game-changing strategies, and so on. All games have them no matter what, even the most balanced games. So it's important for the game developer to make sure that the dominant strategy isn't outlandishly strong. Make it easy to overlook, or make it take work to get to its potential. The team behind Killer Instinct understood this well, which is why they wanted the top tier character hard to use in order to gain access to what made them the best character in the game, while also giving low tier characters powerful gimmicks that once people learn how to get around, leave the player with a bad character. For BB Tag, its dominant strategy would come in the form of a team of Ruby and Gordo, nicknamed Team Scythe. Ruby and Gordo were by far the strongest team in the game, with Ruby being one of the best characters in BB Tag, and Gordo having a full screen assist that if he hits you, you have nothing to look forward to but a full combo. And even if you block it, you had nothing to look forward to but a Ruby mix up. Also, on the off chance that you get past that and beat Ruby, Gordo on his own was no pushover. All of this was combined with a bug in the game called DP Assist, which is pretty much what it says. To give a quick explanation, during the DP command, the active character is invulnerable throughout the move. But someone forgot a line of code or something and made it so both characters are invulnerable while the move is active. So in early BB Tag, it was possible for every assist in the game to become fully invulnerable. And because BB Tag had a mechanic called Active Change, which means that you can switch the inactive character at any point that they are on screen, this made safe switch outs super easy on characters with longer lasting assists with good DP timing. So it was a pretty powerful tool until it got patched out. But Team Scythe became meta-defining, and pretty quickly mad. But I wouldn't say that their existence as the strongest team was the problem. The problem was how far they spread among the meta. To the point if you went to a tournament, you were going to run Team Scythe, no matter what. And if you were lucky, you would just run to the teams that just had Ruby, or just had Gordo. So you had to learn to play against them. Now, you would think that Team Blue would see the damage that this team was doing, and do something about it. The BB Tag community got nothing but silence. EVO 2018 will mark the darkest day of BB Tag's history. On August 4th, 2018, after the BB Tag Grand Finals, they will release a trailer. And during that trailer, Team Blue would make a mistake that would cost BB Tag pretty much all of his remaining standing. After showcasing the second batch of DLC characters, it happened. The announcement of the fifth fate, the fifth series to cross over in BB Tag. After that, the last batch of DLC will be released on August 6, 2018, two days later. And then, nothing. Silence. No news. No updates. No videos. No magazine articles. Just nothing but whispers and rumors. Of course, it wasn't completely nothing. There were bug fixes, but nothing of substance, so basically nothing. It sounds like I'm exaggerating here, but that silence would last until 2019's Evil Japan on February 16th, seven months later. The silence was broken with the news of BB Tag 1.5 with new characters and a bucket list of balance changes. DP assist was now gone, Gordo was nerfed to the ground, and Ruby got a slap on the wrist, breaking up the strongest team in the game. And the fifth fate was revealed to be Arcana Heart, another anime fighting game series, with only one character, its main character, Heart Ana. Honestly, 1.5 provided BB Tag with the healthy meta it was looking for, and for some was the best version of the game. But at what cost? Why did it take so long for this update? It was just a balance patch and three characters. Why did it take seven months to announce a patch? And even worse, why did it take three more months to finally get our hands on it on May 21st, 2019? Well, hindsight is 2020, and we would later find out that the reason it took so long was because of the arcade version of BB Tag. Now you see, before the console market took off and the arcade market started being left in this dying state it is now, 
Fighting games were made on arcade first, and after that, they would take an average 6 months to create an enhanced version of the game for console release, normally adding new characters to get people to buy the game before the arcade version was updated to match. BB Tag and most newer games started either releasing both versions at the same time, or doing the reverse approach, meaning start with the console, then work on arcade board. This wouldn't have exactly been a problem if it wasn't kept secret, or at least one that was kept for 7 months. People thought the game was abandoned, left to its fate with players having to deal with Gordo and Ruby. The crazy thing is, announcing the fifth fate, then do nothing for a while was actually a good move. The rumor mill was running at full blast for the time, and YouTubers kept it going. People were hyped to see what was going to happen. But as time went on, everyone started getting Doc Stalkers is not dead vibes, and people lost interest. This wouldn't have been so bad if DLC was more spaced out, but I digress. Zero communication hurts a game more than a bad launch. It brings an air of the developers not caring, and players feel that. And the ones who stuck with the game during the bad times started leaving. But hey, it looks like they learned their lesson, as during these three months of waiting for the patch to drop, Team Blue would travel from major tournament to major tournament, letting people play the new version of the game. After a year of hardships, things were finally looking up for BB Tag. But wait, I'm missing something. That's right, during BB Tag's 1.5 trailer, at the very end, the sixth fate was announced, and unlike Heart Anno, whose patch gave BB Tag its second wind, the sixth fate would help put the final nail in its coffin. EVO 2019, August 4th, 2019. The announcement of BB Tag 2.0, the last version of BB Tag as of the creation of this video. And may I say outside of two things, this update was great all around. Even though it would take another 7 months between the showing of the 6th fate and finding out what it was, these 7 months were filled with Team Blue being more active. They would put out more information about 1.5 and have demos for the patch leading all the way up to its launch in May. And the players that were left were happy to finally have something, leaving only 3 real months of waiting. And let's be honest, it didn't matter because everyone was too busy with the new patch. But as time went on, they would even do a follow-up trailer showcasing the characters that weren't shown in the first trailer in September. BB Tag 2.0 was an attempt to give BB Tag the launch it deserved. At first, it was thought to be another patch with 9 new characters, but 2.0 was so much more. It was an overhaul of the entire game and then some. New system mechanics were added adding the ability to use a full auto combo to switch out characters, health changes, and a massive balance patch that went as far as changing some characters' movesets. During this time, BB Tag was living large, so what could go wrong? The sixth fate ended up being Sinran Kagra, a game series about warring high school ninja girls. It's hard to describe the series because Sinran Kagra goes all over the place in terms of genre. I mean, look at this. 2D side-scroller, a card game, arena fighter, shoot 'em up rhythm cooking game, dating sim, and even a pinball game. But there is one word to 100% describe Sin Kagra, and that word would be degenerate. But hey, at least we got female Jortara out of it. Nice! And you know what? That's all I'm digging into the series. Yumi was and is still a problem. Able to be effective at all ranges and do unscaled damage, the other one being the Dachi, who is also effective at all ranges, but with some of the best tag setups in the game. If he wasn't teaming with Yumi, he still acts as a great partner to top tiers such as Yu, Ruby, and Chie, or anyone else for that matter, becoming a new Gordo. Sad to say, but this is the last patch of BB Tag as of the creation of this video. Everyone was pretty much stuck with this team, but hey, look at the bright side. 2.0 also brought us a surprise 5th Ruby character, Neo, and a surprise 7th Fate, Akezuki Blitzkopf. The first of the DLC Fates to come with 2 characters instead of 1. Akazuki, the main character, pretty much the Japanese Captain America, and Blitz Tank, a tank. That's cool. If I had to describe Akazuki Blitzkopf, I would call it Dojin Third Strike. 
which is pretty much what they were going for in the first place. Unfortunately, they couldn't save the game. It was too battered and bruised, and was about to handle another round of two really strong characters taking over the meta. But luck was on the side. Arc Revo 2020, Arc System Works World Tour came around and announced two games that they would be showcasing that year. Grand Blue Fantasy vs. and BB Tag 2.0. Finally, BB Tag was going to get so much support and be shown front and center to all Arc 6 fans. To say that Arc Revo was important to BB Tag was an understatement. All fighting games suffer from player decay, which only gets worse as time goes on and players get better. The Dark Era accelerated this pace by 1000% as games were dropping like flies, with some even dropping hard within the same month of release. But World Tours and other showcases help reverse that decay rate, as people tend to want to repeat the cool stuff they see in a showcase, giving the game a boost in players. So let's be realistic here, 2020 will be the final ARC Revo that BB Tag could be a part of, as continuing to actively push an older game such as BB Tag would not benefit ARC System Works enough to justify the push. Not to mention that Team Blue's days with the game were already numbered as is. BB Tag was on its last legs when it came to support, before it was going to get pushed out to make way for newer games. Two of which being Grand Blue Fantasy vs, a game based on the popular gacha game in Japan, and what was then Guilty Gear 2020, but now we know as Guilty Gear Strive. And given that Strive was a mainline Guilty Gear game, not even Grand Blue had a chance of surviving, as Strive served as the time clock for the both of them. BB Tag was going down and there was nothing to save it. So Art Revo served as its going away party and a congratulations to making it to 2.0. So imagine when BB Tag was hit with one final bit of misfortune, one we will call the global pandemic of 2020, when the whole world was shut down. Arc System Works tried moving Arc Revo to online, but it wasn't enough. BB Tag and Grand Blue both ran on delay based netcode, and in fact were the final Arc System Works games to do so. So it didn't get as much hype as it could have. And as Strive hype started rolling, BB Tag would be stuck in the shadows. Support was over. Team Blue had moved on to Blaze Blue Dark War, a gacha game going over unseen Blaze Blue lore events that happened before and after the series, because Blaze Blue has a crazy timeline thing going on. And the worst part is, with the redemption of Street Fighter V, the Dark Era was finally over around this time. And outside for the push for rollback, fighting game discussion had gone back to normal, as shown for Grand Blue not getting massively grilled endlessly for his simple commands for specials and his guard button. The path was clear until it wasn't, and after some of the worst PR for any fighting game, BB Tag was stuck in the darkness that it was born in, another victim of the Dark Era. I'd like to thank you for watching, and if you liked the video, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. But before you go, the video isn't over yet. This is the part where I ask you to give BB Tag an honest try, if you haven't already. And if you did, go ahead and grab your friend and give it another try. In a crazy turn of events, 2021 set in motion BB Tag's revival, starting with the death of Dark War after one full year, and in a surprise twist, at the end of 2021's CEO. Team Blue announced that they were going to work on adding rollback to both BB Tag and Central Fiction. Now is the best time to try it. Get your feet wet in preparation for the rollback update. BB Tag is a unique game unlike any other, built from the ground up to give you the feeling of playing two characters at the same time, and trying its best to give you the characters you love from other series, and do well with them for the most part. It can be silly at times, very silly in fact, but it's a game worth playing. There are 52 characters and over 100 different teams to try. You'll have fun, I guarantee it. While I don't think they're going to go as far as BB Tag 3.0, the rollback patch was something that was never supposed to happen. Team Blue getting back into production for old games fills me with hope, and honestly, I don't know what's going to happen. The interesting thing is, 
BB Tag was data mined a long time ago, and what was found was pre recorded character select screen voice clips for characters from every series that's not in the game. It could have been just a way to detour leakers, or it could have been something more. This is a crossover game with a bunch of companies involved, so it wouldn't surprise me if there was a lot of stuff that was planned in advance and was paused due to the arcade port, the pandemic, and Dark War. But we do not know what the future holds. But until then, know that there's no such thing as a dead game. As long as there's two people playing it, there is always time for a comeback. So may BB Tag live a long life. I was planning on making this video after covering Persona 4 Arena, Blaze Blue, and Underdite. Not Ruby, as there are too many videos out there that can tell you how Ruby had many chances to become a good show. My original plan was to cover the other games to lead up to this one, but I changed my mind. After working on the Undernight video, I learned how much Mori helped the French Bread crew to make Undernight, and also with Dark War crashing down the flames, I felt like it couldn't wait that long before putting out this video. If you watched it to the end, I would like to thank you for doing so and hope you enjoyed the ride. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss my next one. And don't worry, the script is already made so it's not going to take super long like this one did. Also while you're there, tell me in the comments what you think about BB Tag. I honestly want to see your opinion. Until next time my friends, stay scrappy.